Okay, so I'd um, like to welcome uh, Ray Ni uh, here from Johns Hopkins University in the Mechanical Engineering Department. He is um, a, uh, here to, to interact with us or, um, about uh, the subject of his talk today, Bubbles and Spray and Turbulent Flows, and um, potentially would be interested in doing some work here with, related to that in the Sustain Laboratory. Um, I'd like to just before we get going, before I forget to mention it, he'll. What time do you have to be leaving this afternoon, or you have some? I'm pretty flexible. Yeah, so he has. He can be upstairs in room two twelve, and Jennifer can arrange any if anybody wants to meet with him afterwards for any amount of some time to discuss things that you're interested in after you see the talk. Uh, Ray got his uh, PhD in Hong Kong and then uh, moved to a postdoc at Yale. And then to Penn State. Yes. And all in engineering departments, right? Uh, Hong Kong is a physics department. Physics After that, it all engineering. And then, okay, physics in Hong Kong. And now is at Johns Hopkins in the mechanical engineering department doing this, the type of modeling he's going to talk about. So right. take it away. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so this is a work funded primarily by NSF, and uh, uh, we're working on both experiments and modeling of multi-phase flows, so I'm talking a little bit about that. So the, I'm from a mechanical engineer department, so this is actually, I'm a little bit nervous right now because this is my first talk to uh, oceanographers, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, so one important thing I noticed is uh, I, I try to always put my uh, mechanical engineer heads on and see how fancy my facility is uh, until I saw uh, Brian's facility today. I realized that uh, playing the engineering card is probably not the best way to, to do today. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, so, my research background is mostly for multi-phase flow. Essentially, what multi-phase flow is, you have uh, gas-liquid mixture, or you have uh, solid particles in gas phase. You have a, a more than one phase in the fluid mixture, and they travel at a very high speed, and they mix with each other. They have all this very fascinating dynamics. So, for my lab, I, I do a lot of this, what, what I call 3M. Uh, so we call it multi-phase, multi-scale, multidisciplinary. So I, we study a wide range of applications. And uh, the, the thing that dear to my heart is basically is this bubbles and spray uh, for the air-sea interaction, although I know very limited things about the air-sea interaction. But I really like the, uh, the multi-phase component of it. Uh, the general philosophy in my lab is we do uh, two different things. Uh, one thing is a two development. Uh, we do a lot of the uh, optical diagnostics. We, we basically uh, advance the technique and trying to deal with a high concentration three-dimensional particle tracking system. This is really the system enabled us to do a lot of multi-phase flow problem because we can really track <coughs> a lot of particles moving in turbulence. And we can also mirror their interaction with the surrounding turbulence. So we can really understand the details of the uh, micro scale level uh, multi-phase flow problem. But at the same time, uh, the problem, the application I'm going to talk about today uh, is a little about the bubble in, uh, turbulence interaction. I would uh, bring up the sea spray as a uh, uh, potential uh, research subject, but I would probably won't spend too much time on the sea spray part. Uh, just a very simple uh, uh, introduction of the air sea interaction, and this is a painting I love most, which is a great wave of uh, Kanagawa. Uh, and the reason I like this one uh, uh, is because it, it depicted a lot of really interesting uh, scales involving the process, including um, um, so you can see this is a uh, wide cap area, which means that's probably a lot, of, a lot of bubbles in there. And also in the same time, you see a lot of those kind of droplets coming off this wave, which means a lot of uh, sea spray. Uh, one thing I think is very interesting is uh, in terms of painting, is they have this uh, 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 mountain Fuji is actually in the far end background, and but you can see the mountain is much smaller than the wave, not because they're actually smaller, because this is you know, uh, far away from the uh, wave. But this is basically a very nice way to see a different scale, different land scale, different physics within one painting. So I, I really like this one. Uh, I don't know if this is a more scientific uh, 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 drawing of the same problem, but I think this is a basically uh, a picture that is uh, reproduced by Fabrice Varon uh, in his 2015 uh, annual review paper, originally by Edgar uh, Andreas Spike in 1995. I think the the interesting part of this is that you highlight the importance of the uh, bubble and uh, spray. So there are um, 
three different mechanisms uh, proposed in the community that's basically generate spray uh, from bubbles. One is basically a film droplet, the other one is jet drops, and the third one is a spume drops. Uh, and it really depends on, so a lot of focus has been on the jet drops and film drops in the past, uh, simply because in a low speed environment, this is probably more dominant. When we get to high speed, the spoon drop is probably it becomes a very important mechanism. Uh, but the facility that can actually reach that regime is very limited. So I think uh, Brian has, really has a unique capability uh, to address a problem like this. Uh, one thing I think is very important is because different bubbles have a very different mechanism to generate spray. Uh, so the first question I want to address is the bubble size distribution. Uh, I think this is a kind of important problem. Uh, something I did in, uh, so the, in a laboratory environment is if you have a different bubble sizes, if you release in your quiescent water, so this is nothing like a weight breaking process. But it, it sort of helps you to understand the physics that's involved in the process. On the left side, you have something uh, uh, smaller than two millimeter size, so this is a small bubble. On the right side, this is a centimeter size bubbles. So you can see that because of buoyancy difference, millimeter size bubble is really, on, on majority of the bubble is on the water side. And for centimeter bubble, uh, the buoyancy can actually lift it off the surface of the water, so I get into the air part. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, this is not something uh, particularly new, but this is a basic here uh, a way through dynamics usually to study this problem. I want to show this uh, very clearly. On the left side, you can see the bubble burst, and they have this called a jet drop. You really see a jet that forms at the center line, and the jet sort of break up into uh, isolated droplets. But the film drop is a very different mechanism. When the film sort of retract, it break up into tons of droplets. So you can really see that different size of bubble contribute to sea spray in a different way. Another thing, I, I want to replay this video one more time, just want to focus on one thing. The jet drop actually had contributed a lot to the spray uh, chemical mixing state that is different from the film drop. The reason for that is because if you realize that, typically um, the, the particle or contaminants that's uh, 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 cover the surface a little bit different from the top to the bottom. The reason for that is because when the bubble rises up, you have this shear on the surface, and it actually can sweep a lot of hydrophobic particles to the rear end, while the top ends are actually mostly hydrophilic. So basically, when this jet drop formed, is actually formed primarily from the rear end. You can see that it pushed all the way to the rear end and pushed the jet upward. So the drop here is actually contain a lot of the uh, hydrophobic particles. And here, the fume drop is on the top end. So that's why when they break up, you have a lot of those um, uh, droplets actually coming from the hydrophilic part. So the chemical state is actually very, very different. Okay? Uh, so that's the things I want to highlight. But both of them depend on the bubble size. That's why this is the first thing I'm interested in is on the bubble. I think a lot of people probably know this paper before. Uh, if you don't, I think this is a very good reference. This is by Dean Stokes uh, back in 2002, published in the Nature paper, and this is a a very uh, illustrative uh, uh, experiment, which what they do is they're very simple. They have a very, uh, laboratory wave breaking process. And what they did is basically they take a, took an image of this wave breaking process, they count uh, bubble uh, density. So this picture, the vertical axis is the bubble density, which basically means how many bubbles for that particular size. Horizontal axis is the size. You can see that if you plot that in log log scale, you have two very nice power law scaling. And power law scaling, really gets physicists like me excited, okay? So whenever you see a power law, that really means there's something that is a self-similar universal mechanism in this problem. That means it doesn't have to be uh, just for weight breaking. You can reproduce a ph phenomenon in other cases as well. Uh, and what Dean and Stokes did is, very, uh, uh, so they did a dimensional analysis, okay? So for large scale, they did a dimensional analysis. They involved the gas injection rate this number is something I would talk over and over again today. This is energy dissipation rate. So I don't know how many people are familiar with energy dissipation rate in turbulence, but this is a single most important quality for turbulence that quantified the scale-to-scale -scale energy transfer rate. Uh, and the D here is basically the diameter of the bubble. Uh, so for small scale, he introduced a different scaling law by uh, having this uh, uh, V. So the velocity here is basically what he called jet velocity, which is basically this jet. Uh, coming in to the water side and get overturned, so that's the jet velocity he introduced. Uh, relatively speaking, after this work, it, it, it sort of inspired a lot of the follow-up work, and I think people have a community have a good a grasp on this scaling. Okay, people agree on this scaling uh, because the argument is that this is related to the turbulence, 
but on this part, it's actually had more debates. Could you use the fishing pole because I can't see the light that comes out of that? I'm colorblind. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, this is more professional, I think. Yeah, or not. Uh, so <laughs> let's see. Where am I? So okay. So today I'm going to talk about these two skating laws and uh, the barrage system. The first part I'm going to talk about this large scale. Okay, large bubbles. Because large bubble is related to the energy dissipation rate here, so that means the turbines are really driving the breakup process. Uh, so the turbine spectrum we introduce here uh, is this so-called very classical Richardson cascade picture. Uh, everyone is familiar with the Richardson cascade uh, to some degree, I think. This is a very classical picture. Basically, you basically like you have a, copy, uh, a cup of coffee, you stir it, you basically inject the energy at a very, very large scale. You have this kind of large scale uh, eddies, and they start to break down into smaller and smaller eddies until getting to the Commonwealth scale, energy dissipated directly to the heat. You have this range of scales of eddies. Uh, they have roughly the same uh, scale to eddy scale energy transfer, so that's basic energy dissipation rate. If you pick two points of a particular eddy, so they separate by certain scale uh, pertaining to that eddy, and you take the uh, velocity difference and square of that, so that's typically related to energy dissipation rate, times the diameter of the, uh, uh, the eddy to the power of two third. This is a very classical common graph 1941 theory. All right? So if now I put a bubble in there, and I say the bubble has a similar scale with this eddy, and what happens here is you just have to time the density of the water. So that the entire whole thing becomes the dynamic pressure of the stress around the bubble that tends to deform the bubble. Then that also depends on the energy dissipation rate. So this is dynamic pressure gradient. So this is basically the Hinz 1955 theory that basically argued that the, the bubble that's deformed by turbulence and eventually broken by turbulence is related to this dynamic stress applied on the bubble surface. Okay, so that's basically the, the basics of the bubble deformed by turbulence. Now, if you go through a bunch of uh, uh, parameters here, this is basically the stress or they have the same dimension with pressure induced by turbulence. Another force that can uh, deform the uh, uh, bubble is basically the buoyancy force. The buoyancy force is nothing but the density difference. Since the uh, uh, air is much lower density compared with the water, we just use the water density. And times the gravitational constant and times the diameter of the bubble. So that's basically the uh, 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 buoyancy force. Imagine that if you have large bubble rising in water, even just the buoyancy force alone can not deform the bubble. Right. So if you imagine the big bubble, they come up, they don't stay spherical, they stay flattened, simply because you have a pressure on the vertical direction. Uh, then the last thing that is a restoring force is Laplace pressure, or this is basically surface tension. Sigma is a surface tension coefficient divided by diameter. Okay, so basically when the bubble size becomes smaller and smaller, surface tension becomes stronger and stronger, and eventually it becomes very, very hard to deform. So three pressures are involved in this process. For turbulence to induce the breakout to be important, we have to require the turbulence stress larger than the buoyancy, larger than the surface tension. A nice thing about this equation, you have a two unknown for two equations. One is diameter, the other one is energy dissipation. You can actually solve this problem. So for this, to, for this uh, uh, formulation to work, you basically have your diameter has to be a millimeter order, and your energy dissipation rate has to be larger than 0.5 meters squared per cubic second. Okay? And if you're a fluid dynamicist, they tend to use a dimensionless number, which is to take the ratio between this force, this stress, and the surface tension. You get a so-called web number. So web number is a very critical number. When web number is larger than one, that means the turbulence induced the pressure is larger than the restoring force, the bubble can be deformed. When web number is much larger than one, the bubble can be break, broken eventually by turbulence. But in the same time, you also have the Evan Tosh number or Bounce number. So this is a number that tell you about the buoyancy contribution. This number has to be larger than one for buoyancy to deform the bubble. However, in for turbulence case, you really want to have a web number larger than Evan Tosh number, so the turbulence effect is the strongest. Okay, so this is basically the idea. But this is nothing but the same equation here. Following the same equation, you can see that we get to this this conclusion that energy dissipation rate has to be large enough. And for breaking wave in the oceanic environment, it does satisfy this criteria, which means the bubble can be broken by turbulence in the ocean during the wave breaking process, which we already know. But this is just a nice way to say it in a mathematical sense. Another thing for Dings and Stokes uh, scaling laws is uh, mathematically, it's almost the same if you say that the deformation of the bubble is actually proportional to the web number. 
Essentially, what that means is the turbulence to induce the deformation has to be strong enough to dominate the bubble aspiration. Okay, that means that bubble def def deformation and breakup is controlled by turbulence. This is something we want to study. Okay, uh, so this is basically the the pr uh, proposed idea. We need to measure this, but then we realize that this is actually very very challenging. The reason that this is very very challenging because you you require you to measure two things at the same time. One is aspiratial bubble, which means you do need to reconstruct the bubble shape in 3D. Okay, you do need to know what the bubble shape looks like. In 3D, that's very hard. And also, we're talking about millimeter bubble. That means you have to track the small bubbles moving in very strong turbulence and also track their three-dimensional uh, uh, geometry. The other one is web number. The web number here is basically <coughs> means you have to measure the strong turbulence around the bubble. Okay, so not only you have to measure the three-dimensional bubble geometry, you also have to measure the surround, uh, surrounding turbulence. That's why we had to introduce this new facility. This is a vertical system. Uh, the scale is not very big, but the whole purpose of uh, designing this facility is going to maintain a, a homogeneous isotropic turbulent environment. This is not a wave breaking process because, in my mind, the wave breaking process is sort of intermittent, which means you get a one, it, once you, the wave plunge into itself, then everything starts to change, and you don't have a very good way to control the statistics. Here, the, uh, the turbulence maintain a constant rate, basically injective energy to maintain the turbulence, and we have the bubble comes up. So this is a nice way to study bubble deformation and breakup in turbulence. Uh, like John already pointed out, the vertical geometry basically allow you to have a main flow comes down, the bubble rise up, and the purpose of the main flow is to stall the bubble so they can stay in this area for an extended period of time, so their size and volume is not gonna be changed by the uh, hydrodynamic pressure significantly. And uh, uh, so basically, this is all technical t uh, test section. I'm going to tell you why we have to have the technical test section in a second. Uh, but the problem is, when you have a main flow that is only balanced the rise velocity of the bubble, you don't have strong turbulence. Okay, the turbulence never be as strong as breaking wave. So in order to do that, we have this jet array system. So this jet array system is basically we introduce water from side and then shoot them coaxially with main flow. So basically, we introduce the flow coming from the side wave, then it comes down. And the jet velocity can go up to 15 meters per second. Why it can only go up to 15 meters per second? Because after that, I can burst the thing open. Uh, so this is a 3D printed object, which is very delicate. We change a lot of different design in order to make it work. Uh, and finally, we find this uh, uh, sintered uh, uh, polymer beads actually have a very, very strong uh, sort of uh, mechanical property that can hold the high pressure water which goes through that. And we have 80A of them. And the reason for that is because we want to have a homogeneous environment, so the bubble will not burst by the jet directly. Um, and then we have uh, six high-speed cameras. Those are very expensive uh, photon cameras. And I can tell you that I, I had to borrow cameras from my colleagues in order to make it work. Uh, so with six of them, we can actually put them around the perimeter of this test section. And I will tell you why we do need to use that. All right. So this is a facility, uh, so actually the facility doesn't, uh, we still, it's in the warehouse waiting for my lab to be renovated. Uh, so this is a, uh, during my Penn State time when we construct the facility. Uh, you can see that there, there, this is a test section. You have high speed camera all around with LED lighting and uh, fancy particle tracking system. This is a 3D printed object with a lot of tubes coming from this pressure vessel that's shooting AA jets into the system. Uh, and, one, and now I want to show you the uh, video of the bubble within this turbines. Uh, so a lot of the small things uh, around, some of them are micro bubbles, some of them are tracer. This is a large bubble, they can be deformed uh, very violently by turbines. This is recorded at 4,000 frames per second, so that's why it looks very slow, but because we slowed it down. And this is not very big scale, this is only 2.5 millimeter. We zoomed really into the system. One thing, I w as I mentioned to you before, I want to measure the uh, 3D geometry of the system. So uh, we have six cameras. One thing we did is basically re reconstruct their shape. Uh, so with a six camera, you have the shadows of the different bubbles, and eventually you can get the shape. So this is actually we got from the DNS directly. Uh, so I don't know if you can tell the reconstructed shape is green things. And, uh, sorry, the, the actual shape is a green thing, and the gray thing is basically reconstructed. So the uncertainty of the system is actually very small. All right, so now I can, uh, hopefully I can convince you I can reconstruct the 3D geometry of bubbles, and we can also have this particle tracking system. So imagine this is a particle tracking system without the bubbles. Imagine you have a bubble here, 
we can also measure the surrounding flow by using tracers. So tracer is basically a small particle uh, that have a density match with the uh, surrounding fluid. Uh, once you have tracers, you basically can follow the common ground theory. You take two tracers out of the system, then you can measure their velocity differences, and you can use that to quantify the energy dissipation rate. That's exactly what we did, and this is basically the experiment data. So the vertical axis is basically I pick two points, I take their velocity difference, square up that, and the horizontal axis is basically a separation between these two particles. And you can see that this curve is a two-third power law, which is agrees with the common ground theory. This is the data point. So if you do have a very wide inertial range, you can have a very uh, well-developed uh, turbulence statistic in that. Okay? And from this, we can also calculate the energy dissipation rate. And what we got is about 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.5, which is to satisfy the requirement that you really have a high energy dissipation rate. So turbulence-induced uh, deformation and breakup should be severe enough. All right. This is my uh, the, uh, moment I actually feel like I actually accomplished something. So this is a point we can actually uh, track the deformation of bubbling 3D with the surrounding fluid dynamics. So basically, we can see the stretching and deformation of the bubble with the surrounding uh, turbulence. And this really allows us to evaluate the, pro uh, the, the proposed idea, which is, uh, uh, is the deformation of the bubble really driven by the surrounding turbulence, and what is the, actually the key uh, uh, characteristic of turbulence that caused this deformation. All, I'm sorry, all of these are measurements, right? All these are measurements. Looks fancy, but it's a merriment. Yes. So what happened Thank to you. the other part of the bubble there? Uh, the graduate student said he only tracked one bubble at the same time, so that's mm -hmm. why when it broke into two, then the other basically lumped into the other data set. He didn't track anymore. Uh, we're gonna hopefully you can correct that later. Um, all right. So in, now we can do some data analysis since we have this very nice data set. So th imagine this is a bubble. We have a tracer particle around them. One thing we can do is we can start to decompose the velocity, right? So you have a lot of tracer particles. You can first thing you can do is do Taylor expansion. Uh, the two taylor tail expansion is very easy because what the first thing you do is basically you have this mean flow, which is the average of all the tracer particles, their velocity going one direction. The other one is basically the velocity gradient. So velocity gradient is a tensor that means the velocity difference across certain direction. Okay. In order to get this tensor, you need at least four particles. So this is the four particles you have. But you can see from the previous slide, obviously we have a lot more particles. So you can do the least square fit to get the velocity gradient tensor. The velocity gradient tensor allows you to get the rate of strain tensor and the rotational matrix, which basically tell you this two motion. The rate of strain tensor is basically tell you this type of motion to stretch a bubble. And the rotational matrix is basically rotate the bubble. And the rotational matrix is not going to deform the bubble. And the only thing that contributes to the deformation is a rate of strain tensor. Look like this. Okay? And the rate of strain tensor is a symmetrical tensor, which means it has three eigenvectors. Uh, the E1 is the strongest stretching direction, E3 is the strongest uh, compressing direction, which is E1 is a stretch it, E3 is a compressing the bubble. And they work together to deform a bubble and eventually break it. From SIJ, which is a, a rate of strain tensor, you can actually get an energy dissipation rate locally. Okay, from energy dissipation rate, as I mentioned before, you can get a weapon. So this is a very simple idea, although there are a lot of details involved in this process, but I do not want to bore you with all the details. All right, this is a one-time trace, okay? So this horizontal axis is time. I uh, apologize for the, forgot the unit, I think somewhere down there. Uh, the vertical axis is the alpha, which is aspiratio here. So this, you can see the bubble, bubble deform, deformation basically can go up to like two point something. So this is a particular case where the bubble basically deformed just gently. Okay, so this is a small deformation. Now I want to show you the web number. And the web number is have a two contributions. One is basically the red curve. The red curve is basically what I talked about before. It's based on the homograph theory. You have this velocity gradient tensor. You have to form the bubble in this way. Remember that? I have another curve here, which is a slightly different mechanism. So if you make bread, right, so when you make the dough, how do you stretch a dough? You have two ways to do that. One is you put a dough in your hand and you stretch it this way, you can deform it. The other way is just you slap on the flat surface, you can also deform it, okay? This two contribution, the red curve is basically put that into your hand and stretching in a nice and a very elegant way. And the, the blue curve is basically, imagine you have you know, a turbulent environment. The turbulence basically have a lot of slaps. Right, you have the bubbles in there, the turbulence basically slap the bubble in many, many different directions, so that's why it's also causing deformation. Uh, 
Uh, if you pick the maximum one out of this two wave number, you can see you have very nice correlation with these two peaks. So basically, this peak is correlated with a slab motion. The other one peak is caused by this velocity gradient contribution. But all in all, it's the same thing, which is a wave number, which is uh, a turbulence induced the deformation drive the uh, aspiration of the bubble, uh, which is uh, basically what we want to test. Okay, as I mentioned to you before, uh, there's one way to prove that this scaling. Uh, it's driven by turbulence, it's basically showing the S ratio has a very nice elegant way with the web number, and we've achieved that. And uh, uh, so basically we have a good agreement on with uh, Dean and Silk's paper on this region. There's a problem, uh, so this is basically what we have done. There's a problem for this argument when we extend that into this region, okay? So this is basically a critical land scale. What does it mean is, when you go down to a smaller and smaller scale, <coughs> eventually the turbulence induced uh, stress is not sufficient to break a bubble. So simply because when you go to a smaller scale, surface tension becomes stronger and stronger. Eventually, the turbulence is not having enough energy. But then, a lot of people said, well, if after the scale we become even smaller, so the bubble concentration should go down. And simply because you don't have enough energy to break into smaller pieces, right? However, the, the, you see a higher concentration of the small bubbles in this regime. And the question is, where does that energy come from? Okay. Can turbulence still supply that energy? Because based on the web number argument, uh, turbulence can. Right. So if we go back to the, uh, uh, sorry, so uh, forgot to mention this slide. So this slide is basically what I wanted to show about the uh, aspiratial versus web number. So this is a PDF of the aspiratial of the bubble. Um, and this is basically, uh, we measured it just for one particular bubble size in our turbulence. And we show that the web number, okay, if you use web number memory, you can have a very nice agreement with the uh, uh, ash ratio. This is basically what uh, proves uh, what we, the argument we had before for the large scale bubbles. And we also did this for all kinds of different sizes. Uh, for small sizes, you have a better agreement for compared with large sizes. But this is basically uh, a point I was trying to make earlier. Uh, so now we get to the small scale. Uh, so this for small scale, as I mentioned to you before, um, the turbulence at a small scale is not sufficient because if you look at the scaling here, when you reduce the bubble size, this thing grows much, much faster than this thing, okay? So which means um, the, the Laplace pressure eventually becomes dominant in this regime, so turbulence becomes less important if the original homomorphic series still holds. But there's one important assumption made in this picture I haven't really explained to you. One important assumption made in this picture is that the bubble always intact with any of its own size. This is an implicit assumption made by Hinz and Kolmograph and many other people. And this is a reasonable assumption because uh, large eddies to this bubble is probably just mean flow. They just move the bubble in a lot of one direction. And because the bubble itself acting as a very good filter, it's probably a lot of small eddies doesn't matter. So that's why they have this assumption that bubble only acting, uh, interacting with any of its own size. But when you have a lot of very, very intense eddy, will they contribute to the bubble breakup process? So that's the that's the problem we have. Uh, that's a question we have. And but that's a proposal you will never be able to test it uh, in a laboratory environment. And the reason for that is because when you produce a, a turbulence, you have a mix of large eddy to small eddies. You cannot tease out a contribution from different uh, sizes. So that becomes a very hard, challenging problem. We try to ask ourselves. So we, we eventually saw this video and we found out this is probably the best way to do it. So this is a setup called Vortex Ring Collision. Uh, I don't know if many of you guys seen this before, but this is a very nice video you can, on YouTube. You can check it out. Uh, actually, uh, a group of uh, people from Harvard and uh, um, uh, also Netherlands, they tested this uh, facility. So they basically have uh, this two Vortex Ring generator. And what it does is um, uh, they collide, okay? And you can see that the ring, when the ring collides, you have this rim of the ring. So that's where you have the very, very strong vorticity, okay? That's basically like eddy. Let me play it one more time. At this moment, you have this ring of eddy, okay? And after this moment, the eddy, has, the eddy is basically at this particular land scale, okay? And uh, uh, if I keep moving down, and eventually the land scale becomes smaller and smaller. You can see this become a mist. That means the energy started to cascade to smaller and smaller scales. What it does mean is, 
the energy, uh, so the web number will become smaller and smaller because in the very beginning where you have this kind of large eddy, you have energy is strongest. When, when you become a smaller and smaller finer scale and also because of the damping of viscosity, uh, the energy eventually just dissipated. So that's why the web number becomes lower and lower. And then the, well, why are these things keep playing by itself? And the other thing important is that the vortex structure becomes smaller and smaller because as you can clearly see in the very beginning, you have this coherent structure, but later on it becomes this kind of smoke, uh, small uh, scale structures. All right, let me pose a very simple question for you guys. If I have a bubble here, the release into this vortex collision zone, where, it should, where should it break? In the very beginning or, okay. <laughs> So this is just give away all the answers I have. So in the very beginning, you have the strongest web number. This is a keep going. All right, I'm gonna try to uh, guard my uh, computer. Uh, so in the very beginning, uh, you have this very strong vertical structure and energy is the strongest where you have largest web number. And presumably the bubble should break up really violently in that regime. And later on, when the web number becomes smaller and the scale becomes finer, and you don't have enough energy, the bubble shouldn't break anymore. That's a very intuitive way to think about this process. But when we look at this, so we're gonna zoom into this area, we're gonna see a fine detail. So this is a bubble that rises up. You have a, a vortex that's in pain, uh, that, that sort of hit each other, and it started going down. In the very beginning, you do see a breakup process, okay? So, so large vortex structure does break the bubble. So this, you can see from this picture, I'm going to play it slower and slower. The bubble breaks into two sort of equally sized uh, uh, daughter bubbles. Okay, and at this point, your web number is about 25, which is very big. And you do have a breakup when you have a large web number. So that's a consistent with large bubble breakup mechanism. But then, with this thing going down, what's interesting is your web number is keep going down. And your breakup mechanism actually become instead of a less violent, it becomes more violent. So if you zoom into this area, you see that this bubble, when it moves down, you have this breakup, it generated tons of small bubbles, okay? And this is, by the way, this is actually at a very small web number. The web number here is only two, and generate a lot of micro bubbles, okay? So remember that, as we mentioned before, when web number is large, you should have a break breakup, but when the web number goes close to one, you shouldn't. However, it seems to still have successful breakup events. Was, was that from your tank or the, you, you recreated this vortex? I, we, we recreated the vortex. This yeah, this is from our facility. We recreated the vortex. Uh, so this is basically the first setup from our facility. But here I put a die in here just trying to illustrate the location of the vortex. But once we have the system, I do all of them put die in there because they probably have a surfactant which will interfere with bubble dynamics. I remove the dye, so that's why that's a second video which where you show what you see here. All right, so this is basically show the breakup mechanism. And the proposed idea is, when you have a large eddy intact with a bubble of its similar size, you tend to have this kind of a very elegant and elongation of the bubble, where the bubble is basically extended in one direction. Uh, and for the smaller web number, it's instead of having this very nice elongation into a breakup, they actually just appear through the bubble. And when it appears through the bubble, you actually have this kind of very concave shape. You have, end up with a lot of the micro bubbles. And the difference between these two uh, is basically when you do the image analysis, you can calculate two parameters. One is called a perimeter to area ratio, which should tell you how long this uh, entire perimeter compared with the area here. Of course, when you have a spherical bubble, this number will be smallest. We have a very highly distorted one, this number will be large. Another one is axis ratio, which is a major axis divided by a minor axis here. Uh, <clears throat> for these two cases, you can clearly see that a large web number will tend, both large and small web number will have large perimeter to area because they have to deform significantly. But large web number tend to have large axis ratio compared with a uh, small number of web number breakup. When numbers. I look at your, at your pictures, uh, the high speed pictures, I also see uh, that there are waves uh, inside the bubble in the interface and that uh, I presume is surface tension restoring force type of waves and the wave dynamics uh, 
in the bubble might yes. be a contributor to Absolutely. That. So the, the reason you have wave <laughs> my computer will want to move on. Uh, so the, the, the wave dynamic is important to this process, but for bubble cases, the, the reason you you see this wave is because there's a small eddies around them. So mm -hmm. you can see this kind of a fluctuations, but it's not necessarily the surface tension, gen surface tension generated. It's a surface tension coupled with the surrounding forcing. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like a natural oscillation of the bubble, but more like a force oscillation driven by the surrounding force. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so basically, that's the parameter, of the, uh, part of the hypothesis. And uh, indeed, we tested with a large web number and a small web number. So essentially, for large web number, you have this figure is pretty much similar for two cases, except for with micro bubble generation case, you have a little bit lower parameter to error ratio. But this is actually have a dramatic difference, which is uh, uh, typically large web number. You have large S ratio. For small web number, you have a very, very small S ratio which is basically means you can presumably there's a small edit piercing through the bubble and causing one microbubble generation. This is actually quite an important mechanism which indicate that there's a small eddies or turbulence actually very important for microbubble generation in uh, turbulence. I don't know exactly if this is actually a big contributor for the oceanic environment, but that's something we want to investigate. All right. So this is basically what we talked about before. A very important message I want to say is for large bubble, when we have that measurement, we have pretty good confidence that we replicate this parallel scaling. But for small bubble case, even we point out there's a possibility the program still plays a role that can increase the number of concentration of small bubbles, but we, there's no way we can connect directly to this parallel scaling here. So we are still working on the model for that. So that's basically something that's still to be done. All right, I have, I don't know how much time do I have. Um, okay, maybe I have a few minutes to talk about very, another simple problem uh, I'm interested in, which is bubble rise velocity. Bubble rise velocity is actually quite important for ARC interaction, although it's probably missed in a lot of the context uh, due to its lumping to other parameterization problems. But this is actually very important, for example, like a mass exchange, uh, because Imagine uh, the, the mass exchange between the air phase and the surrounding phase. If it's mediated by the bubble, it's proportional to the rise velocity, uh, inversely proportional to the rise velocity. Because the longer time the bubble can stay on the water side, the better it can just uh, diffuse the, uh, the, the gas out. So the bubble rise velocity, most people use uh, the, uh, the bubble rise velocity obtaining a quiescent medium. Okay, the very simple question to ask is, when we stuck that in turbulence, will be any different. So this is a basically a picture I'm showing you uh, in our experiment. We did a both quiescent. Basically, we turn off all the jets. We let the bubble rise. You have this very nice zigzag motion, which is very consistent with a lot of other people have seen. Uh, I have to uh, admit, I, I went to SeaWorld in Orlando yesterday. I, I my son was watching uh, the the orca and dolphin. I was watching bubbles underneath. And I can see it clearly. They also have this zigzag motion upward. Uh, this one is bubble in turbulent medium. You can see their trajectory is very, very different. They have a lot of this kind of, sometimes bubble actually going down simply because of the uh, surrounding turbulent fluctuation driving them down. Uh, so this is a very interesting problem. We want to study that uh, uh, in, in terms of their statistics. All right, this is a classical picture. I don't know if everyone knows about this, but this is a rise of velocity as a function of diameter. If you study bubble, this is something that's quite well known. So what's happening here is basically when you increase the bubble size in the very beginning, the buoyancy starts to become more and more important. <coughs> so bubble rise velocity becomes larger, but it doesn't go up infinitely because eventually the large bubble will generate wake. So you have more drag. So eventually the bubble rise velocity is actually gonna reduce a little bit and saturate to a certain <coughs> number. Okay, so this is a classical understanding. Uh, I have to point out this is for pure water with no contaminants. When you have contaminants, you don't have this peak anymore. You basically go from this line directly to that line. Okay, so that's that's a, uh, something we already know. When I look into the literature, I found out when people do the uh, bubble rising turbulence, you, they do have some literatures on this. It's mostly in the community I grew up from, which is turbulent bubble interaction. Uh, you can see that this is a lot, those curves are basically for, uh, those symbols are basically for the uh, previous experiments and simulation that at a, a certain turbulence level. I have to point out all this experiment have been done in energy dissipation rate that is actually too low to be relevant to the oceanic environment. 
those are very, very low, 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 3. Okay? And the reason to study those for, uh, for turbulence community is trying to study the interaction with turbulence. Then I realized that for oceanic environment, the energy dissipation, background energy dissipation is much higher, automatically higher than this. So what's going to happen there? So this is our experiment. And our experiment is at uh, uh, energy dissipation rate about uh, uh, three, to two all, uh, three to two order of magnitude larger than the previous experiment. And I see very different uh, dynamics. In the very beginning, I saw everything here is just a, you know 30% lower than the quiescent. Maybe I increase energy dissipation rate, I will see something like 60% or something. But this is an order of magnitude difference. And in fact, for if you look at this as a vertical velocity here, for small size bubbles, the rise of velocity is close to zero. Okay, they almost like never rise up. And for large bubbles, however, they rise faster than the crescent median. So that's actually pretty puzzling. Why the small bubble would rise slower, the large bubble actually rise faster? And this is not just a little faster, but factor uh, like 60% faster. Um, so that's interesting. So what we want to do is because we have simultaneous measurements, we have bubble rise velocity, we also measure the surrounding tracer particles. So we want to know what's going on with the surrounding fluid. So in this case, this is the bubble with a lot of tracer particles. I can measure their velocity uh, simultaneously. So I can pick up particles that's actually very close to the bubble and average their velocity. So basically, I get a mean flow velocity around the bubble. So this is basically how I average it, pick all the bubble uh, tracer velocity and divide it by num number. And I realized that the tracer velocity, this is the fluid velocity, okay, this is not a bubble velocity, this is the flow around the bubble. We realized that when we change the bubble size, for small bubble, actually the surrounding fluid is preferentially going down, okay? And for large bubble, the flow is actually preferentially around the bubble, preferentially going up. And that's kind of interesting. I, I was wondering why this is actually the case. So we started to model this, and when we model this, we realized that, remember that there's eddy, in turbulence, and we said the bubble is sort of intact with the eddy of a similar size. So we can do the same argument here. Imagine you have eddy that moves more or less like a solid body rotation. So you can basically say this is a solid body rotation here. And you put a bubble of its size in there. What that means is the bubble basically swept preferentially to the downward side of the eddy for small sizes. But when you move, when you, this bubble becomes bigger and bigger, they actually preferentially swept to the other side, which is upward side. So that's why you can see this kind of transition. Of course, this is just a cartoon. Mathematically, can you actually model this? So one thing we did is basically, so, uh, uh, speaking of which, this is, a, uh, this is actually a backup slide. So uh, this is for different search radius. <coughs> Essentially, we're trying to say that um, this transition from negative velocity to positive velocity does not, is not very sensitive to how big of search area we, we set, okay? All right. So. The modeling of that is actually, a, 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 the slide is a little bit complicated, involves a lot of mass. I try to simplify this as much as I can. Essentially, when, whenever you want to study momentum transfer, right? So if you want to study momentum transfer between two different phases, you have a lot of forces involved in this process, especially for air steam interaction. There's so many different forces. For example, bubble have a buoyancy, okay? But bubble have a different density with the surrounding water. It also have a pressure. Essentially, what that means is if you have a, if you, if you have eddy, the bubble actually trying to go to the center of the eddy instead of go out of the eddy, okay? This is opposite to the heavy particle. For example, if you put a heavy particle in a, in a centrifugal, so in an eddy, it will, be, it will be thrown out because of centrifugal force, okay? But bubble have a lighter density, so trying to be drawn in, so that's the pressure. You also have virtual mass, drag, and lift force that's associated with bubble, but Historically, those are to be very digital, uh, challenging to model in turbulence, and reason for that is because I have five forces. How do I do? How do I measure that? I only have one measurement, which is bubble velocity and bubble acceleration at best. How do we measure all these forces? So, uh, one message I want to tell you guys is, we can actually just use rise of velocity alone to get all forces out simultaneously because of this model. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of details involved in this model. I just want to be as simplified as possible. One argument that we said is bubble location inside the eddy is controlled by two forces balanced with each other. Pressure trying to draw the bubble into the center, the lift force trying to take it out. And the balance between them basically control the location of this bubble. 
And location of the bubble essentially determines the surrounding fluid because I know this eddy uh, from the Comgraf theory. If I know the location in this eddy, I can know the surrounding velocity of, of, of the fluid. So these points here are basically from our measurement, and the solid line here is from our model. Uh, I want to point out we don't have any fitting parameter for the model. This is just the directly from the force balance. Uh, from this force balance, <coughs> we can also get the lift force because the lift force is pushing outward. So this is, we can actually get a lift force coefficient, which I actually agree with the previous uh, uh, publications on the lift force in a quiescent media with the correction term. And the correction term is taking into account the bubble deformation. So this is a horizontal force. Another thing is vertical force, because as soon as I know the fluid velocity here, I know the bubble rise velocity, I can actually know the drag force, because drag force has to be balanced with the buoyancy force in the vertical direction in order to be important for the bubble. So if I do the same case, uh, remember this picture we had before? This is a vertical velocity of a bubble. This is a quiescent media case. And this is our strong turbulence case. So if you're including this model, and the line here is basically the prediction from the model. You can see that it sits right on top of our experiment data. Uh, what's more important is, if we change energy dissipation rate, we get this line. And this line actually goes through all the previous experiment at a much lower energy dissipation rate. So the model has a very good agreement on uh, all the measurements, and this is basically how we quantify the momentum exchange between two different phases. I think this will be a, red, a valuable framework to extend to the um, uh, momentum exchange in this high wind situation. Uh, although this is for single bubble case, but I think for large group of bubble, this can also be uh, can also work. All right. So I'm, and from that one, uh, eventually we can get the uh, drag coefficient. Uh, this is basically a drag coefficient. Uh, we also compare this with the uh, previous experiment for contaminated bubbles uh, for just a quiescent case. We see our cases a little bit lower simply because we have this uh, uh, turbulence effect for large bubbles. All right. So this is my conclusion. So today I basically mentioned uh, about two different problems. One is bubble breakup by turbulence. The other one is bubble rising turbulence. Uh, the focus I hear is basically the, the turbulence has a strong effect on bubbles. And I think in oceanic environment, uh, if we really um, have a good grasp on the uh, background turbulence, we have, have a good prediction of the momentum transfer and other properties in the, uh, for the air-sea interaction. Although my research is primarily focusing on a very, very small scale, okay, we still want to have a collaboration, hopefully, uh, with Brian and other people here and to extend that framework to a larger, larger scale and eventually we can have a better model for the air-sea exchange. Uh, so those are three points. I'm not going to reiterate them. And this is a group of people I work with and uh, my collaborators. I want to thank everyone uh, for, your, uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the rest? Yeah, so I have a question uh, about the wave, I mean, the bubble breaking process. Yes. So I believe there is some kind of mathematical singularity going on when bubble breaks, so I was wondering if there is any like way to kind of model this process based on the measurement. Like, uh, so yes, yeah, so um, <clears throat> so you're talking about the basically at the moment of the breakup. Yeah. Uh, so yes, a group of physicists have been doing this uh, for a long time. You know, Eggers is basically the one who did a lot of this uh, similarity studies of the breaking bubble case. Um, so essentially the understanding is when um, when the, when the turbines actually deform the bubble to the point that started necking, the capillary time scale started kicking, which is much faster than the turbulence time scale. At that point, the breakup will happen. Uh, from a modeling standpoint, a lot of people, because your grid resolution, sometimes grid resolution is not high enough, yeah. uh, you don't necessarily resolve that breakup situation. Yeah. You just have to assume when the bubble deforms to a certain uh, 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 level, then you assume the breakup will happen with a certain probability. Yeah. So that depends on what kind of resolution you have for the model you want to have. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. And one of the um, this is not have much to do with uh, with with bubbles, but um, uh, small scale plankton. Yes. Uh, have to stay in in the mixed layer if they're going to get sunlight. And yes. Do photosynthesis. Yes. So uh, your results for the small scale showing that you go to nearly zero velocity, that may have some kind of evolutionary pressure. On the development of of uh, 
phytoplankton. Yes. Which size phytoplankton were favored may in fact have to do with the same kind of dynamics that you show here. Right. So um, I'm, I'm no expert in that regard, but I have read some papers because they have a, uh, also talked about the turbulence phytoplankton interaction. Mm -hmm. One of the idea I think is very intriguing um, um, uh, by Guido Buffetta. Uh, his idea is basically um, a lot of phytoplankton they want to accumulate because imagine your phytoplankton stuck in uh, turbulence, right? You, it's hard to find your friends, right? So the, basically, phytoplankton need to accumulate to a certain concentration, and the turbulence can help that. And the way to do that is basically the if you have a you can, if you have a gravity preference, if you want to go to the uh, align with the gravity. Mm -hmm. So in the turbulence eddy, you have this uh, rotational motion that's actually create this centrifugal force acting like acceleration. So particles actually can preferentially accumulate into eddy, so they can encounter each other more frequently than the rest part. So there there is a way to uh, for from the evolutionary standpoint, they can interact with the turbulence eddy, or by you know leverage those kind of uh, physics. Um, yes. Well, my question is, of course, lots of applications potentially for <coughs> RSE interaction, especially hurricanes. <laughs> I have one a question. You're talking about turbulence on uh, millimeters and millimeter scales, uh, but you never mentioned the uh, Kolmogorov internal scale of turbulence. Because that's a critical for this type of so Kolmogorov microscale in this case is a fifty micrometer. Oh, so, so small. Yes, because energy dissipation when it's high enough, the Kolmogorov scale is small. So that's why a millimeter is in the inertial range. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Good. When a bubble breaks into two, are the two bubbles do they tend to be similar in size or varying sizes? You're asking a million dollar question here. Uh, so. I can, I can tell you this is a, this is a debate in chemical engineering and also um, so there has been decades of research on bubble breakup modeling. Uh, what you asked is basically the core of that problem. So a lot of people there have been like uh, at least five different review papers on this talking about if the bubble break up into two equal size or break up into two non equal size. So this is what called dollar bubble size distribution um, and. I, I personally believe that it depends on multiple different things. It depends on the energy dissipation rate, it depends on uh, the flow environment, all these kind of things above. Um, so there's no clear answer to that question. Um, if it, it also it depends on who you ask. Um, so it has a very different variety of different models in that. So it's a little bit messy, uh, to be honest. Yeah. Yes? This is probably more of a basic question, but when you show the, the weather numbers for yes. the first part of your talk, is that more of a individual bubble by bubble measurement, or does that kind of take into account the entire section of the fluid or layers of the fluid? All right, all great questions. So um, historically, uh, web number is defined as, so if you say Reynolds number, for example, if you say you have a wind tunnel, you have, you have Reynolds number, that typically means it's a global scale, large scale number. Uh, for web number, it's a similar thing. Typ people would typically define this as one number for the entire experiment, uh, using average energy dissipation rate, use average bubble size. In my opinion, it should be not only um, depends on individual bubble, but it also depends on time and location, which means it has to be instantaneous and locally defined. The reason for that is because energy dissipation rate can be defined locally. Okay, this is a this is actually a core of a turbulent study. Uh, so Kolmogorov have a two different theory. Back in 1941, his most famous theory is on average energy dissipation rate. But his 1962 paper is actually on the intermittency of turbulence, which actually highlight the importance of the local uh, energy dissipation rate. So, so, so back to the question, basically, it should be individual bubble. Um, so that's that's actually very important. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in looking at surface uh, boundary layers uh, in natural systems, there are often uh, Langmuir uh, cells in, in, embedded in the surface layer, kind of the biggest uh, scale ed eddies that you could fit into yes. a mixed layer. Yes. And and so I'm I'm wondering whether uh, there might be some large scale uh, interaction in which the breaking of the wave interacts. 
uh, with the Langmuir circulation and, and in some way concentrates bubbles in one phase of it or another, uh, perhaps to enhance it. I mean, I don't know how the heck you'd, you'd actually experimentally figure that out. But so I have a very simple argument that this probably <clears throat> plays a secondary role. And the reason for that is because time scale. Imagine if you have a Langmuir circulation, right? Yeah. So it's just land scale. Yeah, long time and, scale. And this is a very, very long time scale. Yeah. And bubble actually rise much faster than compared with that time scale, mm -hmm. which means it probably doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, it, and the other reason is because turbulence time scale is even shorter than that, which means you, for modeling perspective, you can easily decouple them and try to study each time scale separately. Mm -hmm. And so my point is it's, it's probably important, but you can separate its mechanism from the turbulence. You can sep you can model the turbulence effect of bubbles, and you can measure uh, you can model the negative uh, circulation effect of bubbles, and you can combine them. Yeah, so it should the, be pretty safe because the scale separation is so large. The large bubble scale that you uh, you have in this cavity generation mechanism when the crest yes falls over those those would be pretty large scale. Yes, but even then, in that case, it might not be large enough. Well, it certainly is important in the very beginning because that that so there's another thing I didn't mention is how how deep the bubble plume penetrates. Yeah. That is sort of a very sensitive to uh, the plunging uh, the behavior of the wave. Right. Yes. Are there any other questions? We need to uh, throw out if anybody would like to see Ray after this. He's upstairs, and Jennifer can let you know where to find him and whether somebody else is with him. Thank you again. All right, thank you so much.